Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and I really just don't know where to begin with the breaking news that we have going on. Two killed, six injured in a shooting attack in Jerusalem, but that's not even the major headline that I'm dealing with. You're about to see a, a, an incredible thing here. New lines have been drawn for the West Bank. At least Google has drawn new lines for the West Bank. I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. On top of that, uh, the United States painting one of its uh, fighter jets to look just like a Russian Sukhoi bomber. Hmm, makes you wonder what's going on. And of course, we already know that another one of the headlines, according to Sputnik News, that you've got Al Nursa, Al Qaeda, all the different uh, Ala Allahs over there in the Middle East and Syria there are joining forces there with the moderate rebels. Uh, it seems like the U.S. has got a plan to where the U.S. can back up and say, well, they're all joining one force now. We can, our hands are tied. We can't bomb nobody. Does that mean then now Russia is not allowed to bomb anything? Oh, I don't know, guys. I I'm telling you, it is a major mess in the Middle East in every direction you can possibly look at. All right, before we get to the breaking news headlines here, let me just remind you, uh, if you are watching here Israeli News Live, take a moment, stop, pause the video, look and see what channel you're watching this broadcast on. I know there's a lot of people that copy our videos, they use all kinds of sensational titles we're seeing uh, that were being viewed by about a half million people a day, but yet you're not on our channel. Same news, same everything, just a different name. If the YouTube channel doesn't say Israeli News Live, or unless you're watching on Vimo where it says Stephen Benoon, if you're not watching in one of these two places here, well, we can't interact with you at all. We noticed that a, a lot of you came and recognized that and actually subscribed here to YouTube, our YouTube channel, Israeli News Live, where you can interact with us. Otherwise, I don't know who you're interacting with. You might have a question, trying to get a question to me, and I have no idea. So check that out and definitely click over, find Israeli News Live on YouTube. That's us. And... Uh, Click right there and subscribe. Get involved here so that we can keep up with you as well. And by the way, too, if God has laid it on your heart to support this particular type of news broadcast, we do need your help. I desperately do. And we thank you for that and your kindness to do so. IsraeliNewsLive.org, which that's another place you could watch the video, right on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. But all the history is here on YouTube. All right, let's get right into this breaking story here. Two killed, six injured in a shooting attack in Jerusalem. This is the one I spoke about this morning. I actually called it a drive-by because they're using a car to drive by. Now, it's sad enough to see that people have been killed in it. The shooter has also been shot. From what last I heard, he was seriously wounded and, um, and is in a hospital, uh, from what I understand. Now, this happened in a place called, or near what we call Ammunition Hill. Uh, I used to live in a neighborhood called Givat Hamivitad, which is just right there, not far from what we call French Hill, where the Hebrew University is. Ammunition Hill, uh, in fact, I know from even the photos that you see there on your screen there, I know these places here. In fact, I used to go there on Ammunition Hill. It's, it's kind of like a memorial park uh, battle where uh, the and during the Independence War, many of the soldiers were killed there defending that, the Israeli soldiers that were fighting in that battle. And I used to go to clean up the park because it just seemed like nobody really cared. So that was something that I was doing back then. But here's what really caught my attention. As I began to, to come in and I looked at the map here, this is a Google map. Let me just, so you can see that on your screen. I don't know how well you can see. Let's kind of blow the screen up a little bit bigger. Maybe that'll help. All right, right here, 2016 copyright, Google Map data, copyright 2016, Google Map, G Israel, uh, Orion, ME, whatever, all that kind of good stuff you see on your screen there. Now, here's what gets interesting, okay? As you can see here, I have to, maybe I have to make it a little smaller so that we don't have anything in the way so that you can see this. You see the, the dotted lines right here, they draw them in there. This is for what is called, as they say it in there, the West Bank. Okay? Now, again, we're not seeing the word Israel that I can see anywhere. You see Beersheba, the Gaza Strip, uh, 
Rishon, Tel Aviv, Yafo, Net Netanya, Nazareth. Uh, we're not seeing anything else in there. Let me, and let's take, and let's do like this. Oh, there's Israel. I apologize. I do have Israel down here in the bottom, just below Beersheba. But that wasn't the issue. I have told you guys for a long time that they're going to divide Israel once again. And I'm going to touch on this lightly. I've been working on a very in-depth study on this that I'll be loading up on our on our secondary channel on YouTube. By the way, that's another one. If you want to sign up on our secondary channel, we have a channel for teachings only, Danoon Institute. That's YouTube, D-E-N-O-O-N Institute. That's the name that I write in my father's name, Stephen uh, Danoon is what I write my books under, both uh, Yam Suf, uh, Israel's Final Exodus, and Israel Are They Still God's People. Those of you that don't know, I write books. I'm actually working on a third book about the prophetic implications of the Syrian war. I'm hoping to actually do this one very rapidly and to show you where it's going. Uh, but anyway, all right, here we go. So as we see, I want to make it clear, West Bank, you see the dotted lines, because we're going to zoom in on this, all right? We're going to zoom in, and we're going to take a very good look here at Jerusalem. All right, now as we're zooming in, I want you to notice where your line is right here. The line for the West Bank is going right through here to a main, main highway there in Jerusalem, and this is the West Bank. Okay, now here's what becomes interesting as we get a little closer. The lines are getting more defined, you can still see it. Hebrew University is drawn in for the state of Israel separately, but all the neighborhoods in between there and all of East Jerusalem is now part of the West Bank, okay? Now, let's move in a little closer because Ammunition Hill is where this happened at. So I'm going up here to Ammunition Hill, all right? Ammunition Hill is now part of the West Bank. It never was before. I lived right here, in this neighborhood right here. I won't say exactly where I lived at because there's a reason for that. It's for safety of a friend of mine. All right, but I lived in this neighborhood right here. This is called Givat Hamivitad. That is a neighborhood. The significance you have to understand is all this area here has been part of Jerusalem. Even I lived there in 2004 during the Second Intifada. I uh, was nearly killed right here by a suicide bomber right at this intersection here in 2004 on September 22nd, 2004, a girl that blew herself up, you know, and my con condolences for her family. I know they're all in, in the condolences for the Jews that died as well. I say that because, you know, somebody had to put this in this poor girl's mind, and, I, and, and so I, I feel for the woman that, that died in this as well. But my, my, my major concern here, all these areas here, Ramad Shlomo, you know, we were looking at getting a house there only about two years ago in Ramad Shlomo. All of this, Ramad D, all these are, have always been part of Jerusalem. Not anymore. All the areas that we call East Jerusalem or always have called East Jerusalem, it is now drawn as part of the West Bank. Uh, Ramat Rachel, uh, Ramat Rachel down here, it did remain in part of Jerusalem. I'm surprised they did that, but it's on the outskirts there. Everything now is part of the West Bank. So if you're living in Israel and you're living on the other side of the line soon, when they finalize this deal, I've been saying it all along, infrastructure is being done and they're going to push the Jewish people out of Jerusalem. Now, it looks like though from what I'm seeing here, that they are, oh wow, there's another one I didn't see either. Here we go again. Okay, this is where it gets serious, guys. Remember when I showed you the tunnel that's being built on the highway for no reason? Okay, what brings you up into Jerusalem? Highway 1. But notice this, West Bank actually cuts off Highway 1 right there. So it's looking like where that tunnel was, is going to be part of the West Bank. Why did they dip it in like that? Why have they done that? Now, let me see if let me see if they've done an update on the uh, 
uh, on the satellite imagery. Let me see if I can pull that up. Here we go. If they've done any updates there, maybe we can actually see the tunnel that they put in there, or what they called it, Eco Bridge. You know, that's funny, an Eco Bridge. Sure, it's an Eco Bridge. Um, I'm just going to see if quickly I can find it here. Okay. All right, here it is right there. The Eco Bridge then is in the land in between what they're calling now. All right, but you're actually going to have to cut through the West Bank to get to where that Eco Bridge is. If I under, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, if I, yeah, okay, that, yeah, it looks like, yeah, that's the Eco Bridge right there. I think that's, yeah, that's it right there. All right, the Eco Bridge there. I believe that that's going to be a checkpoint eventually in time. And what's interesting, let's go back to where you can see it's better. All right, so the Eco Bridge is right in here, but the West Bank cuts it off right there. That's all part of the West Bank. So you have to cut through the West Bank to get to Jerusalem. It's just kind of strange that they're doing this. Now, uh, let me just share with you something, though, before I want to get into some issues that's going on with Russia here in just a moment, very serious issues there with Syria, Russia, United States, etc. But before I do, I wanted to share something with you. Now, let's, uh, I think what would be good to do, though, before I do that, let me pull up uh, memory real quick. Uh, I had it open here just a moment ago. Uh, Daniel 11 here, verse 39, all right? Now, typically, verse 39, you see it right here in Hebrew, and he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god whom he shall acknowledge and shall increase glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a price, all right? That's what we typically see this as. But the other day, God just began to really deal with me, and, and I'm, I'm sitting here, it's late at night like it is now, I'm getting ready to go to my room, and suddenly the Lord put it on my heart, that will divide my land. I'm like, okay. And I believe that that's actually where, that's written in Joel, not Daniel, but Joel. But God just put it on my heart, they'll divide my land. It's His land. All right, and it's his land to give whoever he wants to have it, whether it be Jewish, Arab, whomever he wants, he can give it to. We were exiled, go into exile, for the sins that we committed 2,000 years ago. I'm just saying that because I come from both, both parents being uh, Jewish descent, neither one of them practicing Jews, uh, but still, I come from a Jewish family. Now, the thing is, is our people go into exile, and now... We're wanting to return to the homeland. It's prophecy that our people would return to their homeland. But you know, God never said for us that we would return to the homeland and go drive out the occupants like we see with Joshua, where Joshua goes in and drives out the occupants. This time, it's a little different story. All right? Now, then we, what's funny is before World War I, which there's a lot of evidence that shows show a Jesuit involvement for World War I to stop the Jews from being able to get to Israel. Why? Because there was a major buy of land by some very wealthy Jews. They had brought money together to start buying land because the Turkish Ottoman Empire, there was a little loophole in their law, and they began to start buying land in this area, in what we call Syria today, as well as what we call uh, Jaffa, Tel Aviv, and, and around the, Gol uh, the Golan area, or the, or the Galilee. Huge parts of land were being bought. God would allow that. Now, it's not the Rothschilds that were buying this, friends. It wasn't the Rothschilds. These were different Jews altogether. These were Jews from the Middle East that, you know, they had money. They pulled, and also German Jews that were pulling money together to be able to buy this land. Now, I'm not going to say that, the, that, the, that Rome didn't get involved with the wealthy Jews after World War I and, and, and before, right when they got ready to do their independence and bought up more land to be able to control it. That's true. Rome had a heavy hand in being able to bring this about, but they made sure they did it their way. And, of course, the Protocols of Zion is what Rome did in order to get with some of the Jews that sided with them, like what we have now, these, this bunch of lawless uh, rabbis that have done this Nostra Aetate agreement with Rome. All right, So what they did, they did the Protocols of Zion to kind of stop the Jews from going, and then the next thing you know, World War II comes around, and it sends many of the Jewish people to their death in the concentration camps, which my mother's side lost thousands of people during that time, 
and even my father's extended family. Of course, he wouldn't know because most of my father's family had already come to America, but you know, we have cousins uh, that, that I have. I even a cousin here that uh, has Levitical privileges here in, in Prague in the synagogue here, uh, and they were killed. He tells me thousands of our family were killed as well. Now, but here's the issue I wanted to bring out though. So we came back. They started buying up land to come back. That was cut off. Uh, then World War I comes. And what, you know, the Pope of Rome, and I'm, I've got a big thing I'm working on in that, so I'll save time. I won't go into it right now. But anyway, the Pope wanted to make sure that Britain took over that land to stop the Jews from getting in there and buying it up before the Pope could get it done the way he wanted it. So he has a war come in there. And of course, in the First World War, the British defeated the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire is defeated, and they take over the land and stop the Jews from coming in the way they were doing it. Then they then comes in the Rothschild thing and th things like that in order to buy up land for the purpose of making sure Rome still takes control of it. That's why you also see during after the Holocaust and things, they never allowed the Jews to come in. Oh, they only limited so many. Why? They wanted to make sure certain families got into power. I can go into that greater in detail later. Now, here's what's interesting, though, and this is why I wanted to bring this up. I showed you what it actually says. I think King James is worded a little different than what this says. And he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god whom he shall acknowledge and shall increase in glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a price. Here's what, guys, you probably have never even considered, and this is what God began to deal with me on, was that issue right there, the dividing the land. We automatically think of the two-state solution. That's why we're looking at this right here saying, whoa, my gosh, they're dividing the land. Even Google has drawn the new maps showing that Jerusalem is now divided. And I don't know if anybody's even noticed this yet. Well, you know who, you know the head of Google goes and meets with the Pope of Rome? Of course they divide it. Maybe he went in there and told him, this is what the new lines are, here's where you draw it, draw it out. Okay, so I'm hoping my people in Israel will wake up and realize this too. But listen, this isn't, the, this isn't just the issue. The dividing of Israel was not just speaking of this. That's only part of it. Alright? It's only part of it. Let's take a look at this technically exactly the way it should be. Now, it says right here, and I translated this literally, uh, and made their fortress mighty. All right? Excuse me, is to make or to create. All right? To create a mighty fortress. They created a mighty fortress. Im elo nacher, nacher, excuse me, with a foreign god. Now, actually, this word right here, here it is, nacher, is when it says a foreign, this is the word right here, with a, with a god foreign, but nacher actually is like from a foreign land. It's not just foreign god like some outer space god, but had gone from a foreign land. In other words, what do you have right here? They, made, they, they created or they made a mighty fortress with a foreign god or from a, from a god from another land. All right? That god from another land is Rome. And he made a mighty fortress using his military power, which back during World War I was, was not the United States, rather, but it was Britain. All right? The British government. All right, whom he knows and he greatly respects. That's fascinating in itself. See, and, and, and we get into it right here because, all right, so you have Asha ha, ha, Hakir. Actually, instead of being Hakir, it should be Yakir. And that's, they, that's not me doing it. That's actually the Hebraic scholars. They put Yakir there in parentheses, which is, uh, which, which he knows. Yakir is he knows. Yarabe Kavodi, excuse me, Kavod, all right? Yarabe, Rabe, excuse me. I, I'm getting it backwards. My brain is thinking one way and the other and everything. All right, so he knows and, see, whom he knows and he greatly respects. Hmm. Who's the he? It's the king involved, all right? And they govern. This is where it gets interesting. Because, see, the king 
and this foreign god or this god from a foreign land are governing together, all right, whom he knows and he greatly respects, and they govern many. At this point, it doesn't say they govern many lands. It just says they govern many. Then he says, and the land he divided for a price. So what happened? We have that uh, during World War I, the British come in, they defeat the Ottoman Empire. Now they've taken over all this land that was considered to be what's called today modern-day Jordan, modern-day Syria, not all of it, but big swaths of this area here, as well as uh, what we call modern-day Israel and the West Bank. So the one that has the one that has a mighty fortress, he has a mighty fortress by the help of a foreign god. In other words, Rome dictating to this mighty fortress, whom he knows and he admires greatly, and they govern, they govern together many. They're governing the Arabs. They're governing uh, anyone that lives in that land. They're governing everybody there now. And now they're the ones that determine who's going to get the land. Because he governs many. And he doesn't just govern many there, but he governs many over the entire European area as well. King of the North. Roman Empire. The Babylonian Empire. And they're doing it together. Just like today, you have the Pope of Rome. Now, he's riding the, the American horse, the American mil NATO military power, where he's combined all the forces together. But during World War I, he was riding the British Empire, and they took over the entire Middle East area, and they governed that land together. Isn't it interesting that the Pope of Rome, what was it? And uh, Actually, this is where I was building this. Let me just see if, uh, where I got it at here. Yeah, 1766. Actually, it was more as basically around 1850 where the Pope of Rome finally gets a stronghold with the British Empire once again. So what? S 70 years later, now they've actually got control of the land and they did it. They caused World War I because they saw the Jews were trying to get into the homeland and they were trying to buy land so that they could start returning home and they were sending Jews to settle there. They had to put a stop to it. Now, he divided the land for a price. It's not just the West Bank, friends. All right? It's not just what we're seeing here. Everybody's waiting for Israel to be divided, modern-day Israel. The prophecy was speaking about the fact that, the, that the, there would be a, a, a ruler that would, be, that would be ruled by a foreign god, and of course, the Pope sits on the throne in, in, in Rome and he's exalted himself above all that is called God as if he were God. And he says he is the vicar of Christ or the vicar of Christ, which means a substitute for Yeshua, for, for Jesus. And he's sitting there on the throne, running the whole thing. So the British mandate, remember they give Israel a whole bunch of land. Then the, when the war happens, uh, the Jordanians which are part of the Palestinians of today. They war with each other, and they lost part of it, and what is called today the West Bank, which is what we see here. The reason why Israel does not have this part is because the Jordanians defeated them. So the British ruled the area from 1917 until 1948, and then the British just kind of pulled out. Why, why did the British pull out? Because the British did not want the Jews to get Jerusalem. Because the Pope of Rome wanted to control this. So they divided the land and they give a mandate of what it was supposed to be. And they're continuing. Remember, they have the power over many. Just like the prophecy says, all right, he are governed, he governs many, including in that land. And he is dividing that land for gain. So what we're seeing with, whether it be the West Bank, Gaza Strip, Jordan, Syria, the Golan, it all belongs to Rome. And whatever military power, which it was the British military at that time, but that's also why you see the British so involved in the, in the politics of Israel today and the dividing of the land and the, and the Palestinians getting their own land, etc. It's because 
of what was written in Daniel's prophecy. And I never realized that it had anything to do with Britain at the time. But the prophecy deals with Britain. So it's just fascinating. We'll be going to that later on uh, Danoon Institute. Uh, I'll be loading that on our YouTube channel and Danoon Institute when I go into this deeper. All right, let's... Before I get here to preaching here, I'm trying to stay with news here. Let's get back on news here. Here's what's really serious going on. Now, before I go here, very interesting thing that was on uh, Twitter. I ran across this. I get a lot of, uh, you know, find a lot of information on Twitter that's going on. You're looking here at an American plane. You see it here, the number 12 on it. The number 12 is over here. It's in line there with some others. This is, a, uh, I think that's an F-18, if I'm not mistaken, an F-18 Hornet, if I remember right. Yes, okay, F-18. F it is an F-18. Uh, but they have painted the plane to match the schemes of the Russian Sukhoi bomber. Why? You know, here's, you, here's a Sukhoi. That's a Russian Sukhoi. The underbody is light blue with the white nose tip and the upper body is black with the white tips on the wing tips. They did the same. Dark, or dark anyways, dark gray. Dark gray top, blue bottom, white tip nose. Planes look almost identical. Why would they do that? Maybe, I guess they need to say, you know, John Kerry said, I need some video footage of a, of a, of a Russian or a Syrian plane over here bombing <laughs> the civilians, we don't have anything. Why? Because it's not them bombing them. It happens to be the little thugs that the United States is backing. They're shelling the people and they're killing them, killing the citizens to make it look like it's Russia. Every time a plane flies over, they just go ahead and shell everything just to make it look good. I mean, that's my opinion, because if you have no, if you have no proof that Russia's doing it and all you're doing is speculating, then that's wrong to do. That's, that's still speculation. So now they've painted a plane to look like a Russian bomber. What are they going to do? Send it in there? Why do they just do one? You know? Now, I don't say the plane's in the Middle East. It doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily look like it's in the Middle East. It may be. I don't know. It, I could not find out where the plane is. I've tried to research it. I sent a message, in fact, to see if I can find out where the plane uh, was located at, who took the picture, etc. I've not been able to confirm this as of yet. All I know is I found this on Twitter under UA. All right, now, it was three days ago that this came out. Here's the other thing that's interesting. You want to talk about uh, some of the things John Kirby says in the State Department. And watch this one here. Sputnik News is covering this. Battle for Syria. Daesh affiliate merges with Al Nursa Front U.S.-backed rebels. Offshoot of Junda al-Aqsa paid allegiance to Syria's al-Qaeda affiliate al-Nursa Front in an effort to halt attacks from U.S.-backed rebel groups aligned with the terrorist organization. An official statement released earlier today, an extremist uh, Jun Aqsa terror group, a prominent affiliate of Daesh terrorist network and radical organization, has merged with al-Nursa Front, formerly al-Qaeda's Syrian affiliate that fights with U.S.-backed rebels, Groups including Ahara al Sham under the umbrella group of the Army uh, Conquest. The merging of the two groups follows intense fighting between extremists with US backed Ahara al Sham joined by Al Nursa Front in the fight uh, waging a series of bloody offensive against the Daesh affiliate, leading to the group to give in and pursue the path of least resistance by joining armies with Al Qaeda linked terrorists uh, against the Syrian government. Well, you know, the U.S. just backed the, the ISIS group not long ago, so maybe it's the U.S. trying to broker peace between them. That way they can tell Russia, I'm sorry, you're not supposed to bomb any of those because those are moderate rebels. You see how the United States has helped setting up a stage to where they can justify coming in for an attack. And we wonder why Russia's on high alert. I don't see things ending very well, guys. I just don't see it. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Don't forget, by the way, check your channel. See where you're watching at. If you're not on Israeli News Live on YouTube, go click and subscribe there. And if God lays it on your heart to be a part of this work, please, by all means, go to IsraeliNewsLive.org. We certainly could use your help, and we thank you for it. God bless you, and good night.